All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Cody Touche. I work at Caliber Home Loans. Um, I've been a mortgage lender now, uh, actually March, so in another two weeks, week and a half, I'll be celebrating my 20 year anniversary of this. And you might think, how could you do that? You only look like you're 21 years old. <laughs> it's true, I started when I was one, just kidding. Um, so here's all my contact information. Feel free to look me up. I got cards over there as well. Uh, I just want to give you guys a brief overview. This is just scratching the surface of all the things that we talk about or, or do inside of the an investor realm of uh, mortgage. So uh, Igor has all the fun stuff, right? The sexy properties, uh, going out looking at houses and crunching numbers for rent. Uh, but we have the kind of the, the nerdy part, uh, qualifying for mortgage and finding out if you can actually do it. And sometimes, unfortunately, having to say no uh, as well. But we love to say yes. We try, try not to say no ever. Um, give you a little idea of who I am and what I've, what I, what I've done. Is, so like I mentioned, 20 years in the mortgage field. Uh, I own actually 84 doors right now. Uh, that spans uh, the area. So we've got uh, I-5 corridor from uh, as far south as uh, Des Moines, uh, Auburn area. Uh, by looking at a 20 unit apartment complex in Spanaway right now, and then all the way up to like Marysville, Lake Stevens area, a little bit of everything in between. A uh, couple of houses in Spokane, and then uh, also in Oklahoma City, uh, currently targeting also just outside of Nashville, and then um, uh, just got sent a 34 unit in Killeen, Texas as well. So we're evaluating properties all around the country uh, for, for good cash flow. Uh, I've at, been in three syndications, uh, so a total of almost a thousand units between those three different syndications. Um, 14 flips. Most recently, last year, I sold. I bought a house for 517, put about 300 into it, and sold it for 1.1 million. Um, right now, I just actually closed on one last Friday. A silver first flip we bought for 340. Needs about 100 grand in renovation. Should be worth about six when we're done. Um, Several 1031 exchanges right now actually sitting on a big chunk of money from a sale of a property in Auburn to be able to move into the next uh, commercial building. Uh, I've bought and sold many properties, uh, not sold many, but I bought many properties from foreclosure. Uh, Those are either some of my buy and holds or flip properties that we've done. Um, I bought and sold on assignment as well. Uh, And then out of state and in state, we've talked about that. And uh, I say burr for days. That's how I got started uh, in the industry was um, doing Burr style investment. Who's heard, who's heard of Burr? You guys know what Burr is? Okay, so a few people that don't. So I'll clue you in. So Burr stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. And there's a there's another R that we're adding on there too. It's called retire, right? So that's my favorite of the R's. It used to be repeat, but now it's uh, the retire part. Um, the repeat is actually the 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 main benefit of doing that burst style investment. But the idea is that you buy inexpensive or under market properties from your wholesale buddies, you fix them up well, you don't overspend, you get them tenanted, and then you come back and refinance them. And if you do it right, you can get your cash back. Okay. So if you can do that, you can use that same capital over and over and over again. Thus the repeat part. Okay. Timeline. So there's a little story in my, a uh, little bit of my story, right? So 2000, I said I started um, market crash six years later, I was just getting ramped up, right? Uh, <laughs> mortgage business and the real estate business, it takes a little while to get going, but uh, it's like a, you could say like a snowball going down the hill, right? It takes a little while to get going, but once it's going, it's going good. Uh, except for when the market crashes uh, about the time you've got critical mass, right? So all of a sudden I went from closing probably 10, 11 loans per month to one to two loans per month because there just wasn't anybody buying. The same period of time, rates spiked up, home prices went down, there was no refinances to be had. Nobody was buying houses. Nothing was moving. It was just very stagnant. And then all of a sudden, in 2018 or 2008, we started seeing a lot of these properties go back to the bank. Right. So people couldn't afford them. Uh, banks at the at this window of time, from six to eight, the banks kind of didn't know what to do. Right. They had their head in the sand. They thought that maybe things would work out, and they didn't know what to do. They didn't have any staff to be able to do these uh, either short sales or foreclosure. So a lot of times, properties would just sit. And I remember going to foreclosure auctions and seeing a property that had been vacant for three years, right? We'd walk in and we'd see that the, the, the winterization had happened three years prior to the foreclosure sale, right? It doesn't take that long to foreclose on a house, but the banks couldn't get their stuff together and actually make it happen. So a lot of opportunities in this zone from 2008 to 2009 or 2008 to 2010 and 11. This is when I bought a big majority of the properties that I've, that I've got. Um, 2011, things started turning around, right? We, we can now see f- through uh, historical glasses that that was pretty much the bottom of our marketplace here. 
So we started seeing things come up. So me as a, as a uh, mortgage guy that had um, a little bit of cash, a whole lot of time on my hands and not a lot of income anymore, uh, I had to find something to fill the gap, right? And so for me, that was flipping. So I would buy a property, fix it up, and then put it back on the market and sell it. And in those window, that window of time in 2009 and 10, you had to be the best house on the block, the cheapest house on the block, and hope to God you sold very quickly. Because if you didn't, all of a sudden your house price would have to come down. And then you'd have to start chasing the market down. Now, if you make a mistake and you, on a flip, the market can bail you out. Then the market would bury you, right? So you had to be really careful about what you were doing there. So we started to see in 2011, the market was starting to bail people out, right? Igor mentioned the flip this house or the HGTV show. By about 2010, midway 2010, all those shows were in massive syndication and every, you couldn't turn on HGTV without seeing a flipping show, right? And so now the foreclosure auctions weren't very crowded, but now all of a sudden everybody and their brother's there, right? So everybody's there, everybody's looking for a deal. So they're starting to price us out. So the only people that could actually buy were people that were gonna hold on to the property. And so we started buying a lot more and, and holding on to them. Um, I actually had a kind of a failed flip in uh, Marysville. It was gonna make about $15,000 on the flip. And that wasn't, an, it wasn't a really good rate of return. But I figured I could rent it and make about $500 a month. So for me, that was a pretty easy math, right? If I'm gonna make $6,000 a year or $15,000 once, which would I rather have, right? I had the capability to hold on to that property, so I held on to that property. So uh, 2018, we, barely, we, we pretty much got back to pre-crash numbers. And now we've seen them kind of stagnate a little bit, right? Over the last 12 to 24 months, things kind of stabilized a little bit. Uh, part of that was rates going up, but now we've seen rates come back down. And what have we seen? Market's hot as ever, right? And so I think we're going to have a really good year for appreciation this year. So uh, fix and flip, turnkey, flip and hold, and wholesale. Those are all methods that I think can be valuable for somebody that wants to be a real estate investor. Um, I started by flipping because I needed to make money, right? I had some cash, but I needed to make money at the time. Um, I've got a guy in my office. His method is buying turnkey. He's like, ah, why would I want to renovate a property? That sounds terrible. Um, I'd rather just put my 20% down, let it, let it marinate, and then go buy another one off my cash flow. Right? So the guy's a pretty good income earner, income earner, so he's able to replace his down payment quickly with, quickly with his cash flow. So he puts, buys a house in Spokane for 100 grand, puts 20 grand down, finances it, makes him five, 600 bucks a month. He's a super happy camper. Um, another two, three, four, five, six months goes by, he stacks up some cash, does it again. And he's got really, relatively clean units. He doesn't have to do a lot of work to them. That works out really good for him. Um, flip and hold, that's kind of my strategy. I like to do value add. Uh, a lot of our investors that we work with have a limited amount of cash or they're not super high income earners. They can't replace uh, $30,000, $40,000 very quickly. Uh, or in, in our marketplace, right? He's buying in Spokane and Oklahoma. If you want to buy in Everett or Renton, you're going to have to drop hundred grand on a piece of property, right? So if you drop hundred grand on a piece of property and you're a turnkey investor, and you're making, let's say you make $1,000 a month on your $100,000 investment, how long does it take you to get your $100,000 back to go do it again? A hundred months, right? Like, yeah, it's a long time. It's going to take forever. So you're not going to be able to get back in, in the game very quickly. So if you can take that hundred grand and do a burr, buy it, fix it up, get it rented, come back, refinance and get, maybe you get 80 grand back or 90 grand back. You don't even get every penny back, but you get a lot of it. And then you can go back and, and get back into the market and do it again and again and again. Uh, live in flip. This can be a great one. Um, I, you could say I'm doing it now. Actually, I just moved out, but we bought a, a, a dumpy house on Lake Washington, right? Very, very dumpy house on Lake Washington, ready for the bulldozer. Uh, I, I fixed it up a little bit. I lived in it for a couple of years. And then now we're just about ready for permits, crossing my fingers, um, that we can tear it down and build a new place. So that's going to be a, a flip for me that you, as a, as a single person, you can make $250,000 on that and not pay any capital gains. Whereas on my flipping days, if I made 50 grand, 30, 40% of that, 30, 35% of that's going to government, right? Because you're paying regular income tax on a flip that you hold less than a year. So it can be very expensive from a tax perspective. If you live in it for a couple of years, you can sell it and not have to pay any capital gains. So that can be a really great way to be an investor as well. And it doesn't require a lot of capital because you can do that with owner-occupied financing, right? Put very little down to do it. 
So Burr, shoot, I sold my thunder for this slide. Um, buy, renovate, rent, refi, repeat. Um, so a lot of times we'll use hard money or cash to do that because you're buying properties that maybe couldn't otherwise be financed, right? Uh, the one in Silver Firs, hole in the roof, rats everywhere, garbage inside, right? It was not in a shape where an <laughs> appraiser is going to come and say, very nice house, let's mark this one down, right? They're, 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 they just wouldn't allow it. So I used hard money instead. Um, it can be a little extra expensive, but if you don't have the cash to do a $500,000 flip, it's a great way to make $30,000, dollars $50,000. Um, we do have a renovation product as well through Fannie Mae. Um, it's not a, an advantageous product because it takes a lot longer to close and you have to use a general contractor. You can't sub it out yourself. So um, it can be a good solution though, especially if you're going to move in. Flip versus hold. I mentioned this earlier. Um, we talked about that property. I always, no matter what I'm looking at, whether it be an investment uh, that I think I'm going to hold long term or something that I'm going to buy to flip, I do this analysis and I figure, okay, if I sold this today, what would I net out of it? If I held it as a rental, how much could I make on a monthly basis? And I just do the math, right? So in that case that I showed you earlier, $15,000 in one-time profit versus $500 a month, it broke even in 2.5 years. So in two and a half years, I would have made my $15,000 that I would have made only one time and not had the asset anymore. So that one made a ton of sense. If you've got another property, let's say you, you buy it really right and the rent just wouldn't be great and it would only net you $500 a month, if you could sell it and put a hundred grand cash in your pocket, that takes 200 months to break even. So you might have gone into this investment thinking, I'm going to hold this as a long-term rental, but you do a great job of fixing it up. You get it all tenanted and by a, the cap rate calculation, uh, you're, you're, you uncover like, hey, I've, I've really added a lot of value to this. I might be better off taking my cash, right? So every time I do a project, I make sure I do that analysis so I'm not leaving extra equity in the property. So uh, evaluate, right? Who's heard of net NOI? Okay, awesome. Got an experienced room and, uh, group in here. So an NOI is just net operating income, right? That's all your income minus all your expenses, not including mortgage. That's a key important figure because it will help you determine value based on the cap rate, okay? Um, rules of thumb, we like to have these as well. Uh, I just was explaining this to an investor earlier today, the 1% rule. 1% rule basically states that if you're gonna spend $100,000 on a property, it should rent for $1,000 a month, okay? So that's a really simple rule, and if you can get to the 1% rule, you're absolutely gonna make money. Igor sent me one earlier today. It was in this area, and it was darn close to the 1% rule. If you, can, if you can buy something on this side of the mountains and be at a 0.8 or 0.9, you are crushing it, right? That's a really great buy. Um, my property is in Oklahoma, uh, I bought a 37 unit for just under $1.5 million. That's about $40,000 a unit, right? They rent for 600. That's a 1.5 rule, right? But the property you go show me is going to go up 8 or 9 or 10% per year. That property in Oklahoma is going to go up 1% per year, maybe, right? So I'm getting cash flow, but I'm not really getting appreciation. The one Igor sent me earlier today, you probably get a bit of both, right? It actually had some cash flow and you're going to get really good appreciation in that marketplace. So what I look for is I look for something that is going to have a 4 to 5% cap rate uh, in, a, in a really great marketplace like this. And I want to say that one was 7%, I think, wasn't it? Uh, that one was 645. 645. So 6.5% cap rate and in what I would still call a heavily appreciating market. Uh, the Oklahomas of the world, the Spokans of the world, the uh, Killeen Texases of the world, I'm going to be looking for a seven plus cap rate on those because I'm not going to get the appreciation uh, to be able to offset that ex the, inc the amount of money I'm going to have to put in that investment. Does that make sense? Can you yep. Yeah, sure. So cap rate is capitalization rate. That basically states how quickly you get your cash back. Okay. So for simple math, if you put in $100,000 as your investment, or I'm sorry, if you put in a hundred, if you bought something for $100,000 and it made $10,000 per year, that would be a 10,000 or that'd be a 10% cap rate. Okay. So how quickly you get back your initial investment. So NOI, net operating income divided by the purchase price equals your cap rate, right? That's a simple way to calculate that. So purchase price or cap? Purchase price, value, and, that, and that, that's, that's the other way to think about that is value of the property too, right? So on your purchase, it's purchase price. 
after purchase its value, right? So what you could sell it for. And so when you buy, you want a high cap rate. And when you sell, you want to sell at a low, as the lowest possible cap rate. Because the way that math works is if we've got, you got to think about this on, on, on your page here, and I wish I had a board to write on, sorry. Um, go back to your algebra days, right? We've got three equations, three, three variables in this equation. We've got NOI, we've got the price, and we've got the cap rate. Generally speaking, in marketplaces, you know the cap rate. You know the cap rate of where things are going to trade. Okay, so if I can if I can buy something in Renton at a seven percent cap, that's a killer deal because I can sell it. Like that's you're not going to find that on the market, but you could find it off market, maybe right wholesale right. So let's but but you let's say you could find that off market. Immediately there's more value in that property because the standard cap rate in the area is lower. So what I mean by that, and maybe I'll grab a, I didn't grab my phone. Anybody got their phone out? Do a little math for me. Um, let's say you're going to buy something at a 7% cap rate, okay? And the property is a million dollars, okay? And so we got to figure out what's the net operating income. So somebody do that math for me. I got a uh, million dollars times 70,000. Okay, great. So how we can create extra value. Now here, here's what you're thinking. We've got to remember, this is non-mortgage so this is not cash in your hand, yes, right? This is not covered debt service. And the reason why we don't include debt service in here is because that way you can compare, like Igor said, you can compare 15 properties all across the board. What's their cap rate? Now we've got to look at what does the financing look like on each one of those, right? Because each one's going to be a little different. And your financing might look different than my financing, right? So this is a way to evaluate a property without having to consider the buyers of the property, okay? So... Yeah, so it does sound like a lot, but it's not going to be a lot after you cover your debt service if you just put minimum down, okay? So let's do this math though real quick. So the 7% cap rate gives you $70,000 in NOI, right? Now let's say I want to, I'm going to, now I'm going to sell the same property, okay? So if anybody's got a calculator there, $70,000 divided by 0.05. $1.4 million. Okay, you see how that works, right? If I buy at 7% cap rate at a million dollars, but the market is trading at a 5% cap rate, instantaneously there's $400,000 in value there. Because what that means is I bought, I bought something that not everybody could buy. I got it off market or I bought it, or more than likely, I'm gonna buy it at a 7% cap rate, but it needs a little love, right? Need some paint, need some carpet, need some maybe new, some new tenants. So you're probably not going to be able to trade at a 5% cap rate right away because if I'm a savvy investor, I'm not going to pay a 5% cap rate for a building that needs work. But if you've bought it a 7% cap rate, put a hundred grand into it, got it all freshed up and it's all good, now maybe it's worth 1.4, right? So the other thing that we can do is there's, there's three parts of this equation. We know the cap rate. We want to buy high and sell low. Never say that, all right? That's how we, no, we don't want to do that in stocks, but we want to do that with cap rates. Um, we know the value that we're looking for. The NOI is where we can actually make some adjustments, right? So we buy a property and we raise the rents, right? We add back rubs. You guys know what rubs are? Rent utility billbacks, okay? So a lot of apartments are doing this now. You, you got an apartment, I've got a, a fourplex in Linwood and they rent for 1300 a month, okay? Uh, I want to raise the rents, but I don't really want to raise the rents in the advertisements. So what I'm going to do is say that doesn't include water, sewer, garbage. Water, sewer, garbage is $75 more per month. So now I'm getting $1,375, right? But I'm advertising $1,300 to compare. So I'm advertising $1,300 for rent because that is the rent. It's fine print, water, sewer, garbage, $75 a month, right? So now I'm bringing in another $75 because I'm paying water, sewer, garbage as the owner, right? We don't want the tenants to pay that because they're not going to pay it. And then they're going to move out and then you're going to get stuck with a bill. Right? So you pay it, charge them for it after the fact. We put in low flow toilets, shower heads, and sinks. If we save, so cap rate, right? If we saved, uh, I don't know, $100 a month on utilities, just a water, sewer, garbage bill, that's $1,200 $1, per year. $1,200 per year divided by 0 0.05. Anybody got my number? Six grand? No. What is that? $1,200 divided by 0 0.05. 24. $24,000. So in a four or five plex, could I put in some low flow 
sinks and faucets and toilets and make $24,000 in added value? Absolutely, right? So we're doing that. We're hardening the surfaces, right? We're putting in uh, quartz or granite countertops. And most people say, oh gosh, why would you put that in a rental? Because tenants destroy Formica, right? It's cheap, but you got to put it in every couple of years, right? So doing things to improve the net operating income uh, by either reducing expense or increasing income will drive value as well, right? Um, okay, cool. Everybody get that? Make sense? Uh, so ways to fund, right? So sometimes people, that's one of their biggest hiccups or, or hurdles into getting into investing in real estate. Obviously, if you have cash, great, let's go spend it, right? Let's go buy you some properties. Um, home equity lines of credit or, or using the home equity in your property can be a fantastic way to fund this. Uh, generally speaking, if you're going to take $100,000 out of your house, it's probably going to cost you about 500 bucks a month, right? If you did a $100,000 cash out refi. If you're going to put that same $100,000 into a fourplex in Des Moines, you're probably gonna make about $1,000 to $1,200 a month. So every $100,000 you take out is gonna cost you some money, but if you put it in the right investment, it's gonna end up making you money. I've showed several of our clients how to do this where they've been selling a property and buying a new one and they sell a property and they got 500 grand in positive uh, cash out of that property and they tell me they wanna put 500 grand down on their new $700,000 house. I say, no, you don't wanna do that. I mean, you could, but you probably don't wanna do that and here's why. So we repurpose that money. We put 20% down. We don't have any mortgage insurance. We get the best prime, uh, prime interest rates. Everything's good. But now we've got a $350,000 nest egg to go invest in some other properties, right? So if they're willing to and able to take that risk, that 350, generally speaking, we can do a four times multiplier, right? So that's another $1.4 million worth of real estate they can buy that's going to throw off cash flow. Generally speaking, that extra 350 is going to cost them another 1,700 bucks on their monthly payment, but I can show them how to make 35 to 4,000 dollars a month. So now their new tenants are fully paying for their mortgage. So they wanted to put 500 grand down as a conservative way to have a low payment. But instead, now they've got 12 or 15 people that are contributing to paying their mortgage payment completely, and they don't have a mortgage payment. They've got a lot of debt, don't get me wrong but they've got no bill anymore because all these people are paying it. And so what's more conservative, having 15 people pay three mortgages or one person pay one mortgage? I'd rather spread it out and I'd rather not be the guy paying the mortgage. That's my philosophy. Okay, so home equity. Selling a home to level up. We just, that's exactly what we just talked about. Partnerships, uh, oftentimes these kinds of events are fantastic ways to form partnerships. You've got somebody that has all kinds of money and no time, and you've got somebody in the room that has all kinds of time, skill, drive, determination, but they don't have a lot of money, right? So pair up and, and make, a, make a partnership work. Uh, flip to acquire more cash. That was my original philosophy, right? I was getting started in the mortgage business, things were going good, and all of a sudden they weren't. So I flipped, 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 and I paid my bills with it, and then I started acquiring more and more cash, and then I was able to use that to turn it into rentals all in long term. Uh, lending guidelines. So this is where we get nerd out a little bit, right? So get out your pocket protectors. Um, a little bit of detail here. You can take pictures if you want. We're going to be recording and sending this, so I'm sure you'll see it. Uh, investment property is a little different financing than it is for single family uh, owner occupied financing. Takes more down, right? You're going to have to put some more uh, cash in the in the bank. Uh, generally speaking, eight, eight, 85 percent um, for single family, two through four units is going to require 25 percent down. So 25%, 75% LTV, or 15% down and 85%. Most single, proper, single investment property buyers do not put 15% down, they put 20% down because the mortgage insurance is quite expensive at that level, so they don't usually do it. Uh, we put here DUNLP. There's two main backers of mortgages in the, um, in the United States. You've got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They have slightly different guidelines, and so that's why we will usually put this up there. One key piece to note for our investor friends, Fannie Mae is very forgiving for LLCs. Freddie Mac is the opposite. If you want to move your properties into LLCs after you've bought your investment properties, you want to make sure you get a Fannie Mae loan. Freddie Mac will call it due. You'll have to start all over. So Fannie Mae won't be calling it now because of the future the, uh, or the case Great question, and I will clarify. They will not call the note due if the same people that bought it own the LLC. So if you buy a piece of property and then you transfer that into an LLC that you and I own 50-50, that's a problem. If 
you and your wife buy a piece of property and you move it in an LLC that's owned by you and your wife, that's okay. Does that make sense? So that's Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae, is Fannie Mae only. Yeah, Freddie Mac, don't do it. Question, do you have to provide to them the LLC document? You don't actually have to do that, no. Um, if, they, if they asked later on, yes, you might. So you'd have to show that it's the same ownership. But most of the time, they're not going to ask. Freddie Mac will get, they'll both get notified. Fannie Mae just says, ah, they, they most of the time just assume. Freddie Mac, I've had clients where they got Freddie Mac loans with other lenders and didn't know. And then they called me and it's like, what's this? And I said, well, your loan's backed by Freddie Mac and they can call it due. And, and they were. And they said, well, how do they know? Well, when you change your insurance, right? You change your insurance, says the insurance guy, you're wearing an insurance t-shirt, right? Yep. When you change your insurance, you put it in the name of the LLC. Separately insured is as the person that owns the LLC, but it still needs to be in the name of the LLC. Um, the check should be written from an LLC to pay the mortgage. And that's the other thing too. We, LLC is a whole nother ball of wax, but if you don't pay your mortgage check from your LLC bank account, you've already busted your LLC. You might as well not done it. Okay. It's very easy to bust the LLC. So, so what I do, I just, I don't actually have most of my stuff in LLCs. I have a giant umbrella policy to cover me for other stuff. Um, my commercial properties, very acceptable to have it in LLC, and I've done that, but on my residential stuff, it's all in my own personal name. Okay, so um, rate and term. This is where we talk about refinancing. So refinancing is a big part of the Burr strategy, so we go into a little bit deeper. Uh, refinancing a loan that's already in place is not, not getting any cash out. That's the definition of a rate and term refinance, okay? We can cover closing costs, but you can't get a pile of cash back in your hands, right? I can probably get you two, maybe five grand, but you're not gonna get your $50,000 renovation budget with this type of loan. There's no seasoning from purchase, so you could buy that property in January with a, with a, a mortgage, fix it all up, come back, refinance it, get it, like let's say you use hard money, you're gonna pay off your hard money, 30 days later, no seasoning, you're all good. LTVs are based on ARV. Right? So you are allowed to use the current market value, not what you paid for it with this type of transaction. And that's very valuable because it adds equity. Right? So you might be able to buy something with hard money with say 10% down, create a little extra value, do your refinance, and maybe you have 20 or 25% equity. The greater your equity position, the better your financing is going to be. Okay? Um, oh, and the appraiser will notate if there's been a rapid increase in value. Right, so you have to actually do some value or do some value add to get some value, right? Uh, some of our clients will buy really great deals uh, and expect them to be worth a, t a pile more right away after not doing a lot of work. That doesn't usually happen, right? You gotta be able to show that you've done some actual value adds. Cash out refinance, this is where everybody uh, gets tripped up, right? So the, you buy a property, you buy it for 100 grand, you put 50 into it and it's worth 250 when you're done, you're like, great, I wanna get 80% loan to value and get a pile of cash and go do it all again. You can do that, but LTV requirements, 75% for single family, 70% for multifamily. So that's just down five, base, five percentage points from the um, rate and term refinance. Cash out means you're going to use LTV based on ARV. It does require a six month seasoning from acquisition to closing. So if you've got a project that's gonna take two or three or four months to renovate, great, you're almost there, right? But if you've bought something and immediately it's worth a pile more, you're gonna to have to wait a little bit to get that extra cash back out, okay? Uh, and there's no actual limit to the cash out on that other than you have to stick to the LTVs, okay? Delayed financing is kind of an interesting thing that we offer that's kind of in between. Uh, what this is meant for is when somebody comes in and pays cash for a piece of property. So there's no mortgage on it, right? There's no mortgage on it. You can't do a rate and term refinance, right? Because rate and term just means you're paying off the old mortgage. But with delayed financing, if you bought it with 100% cash, we can use these LTVs, 75 and 70, and get actual cash back in your hand. It's not considered a cash out refinance if you paid cash. Does that make sense? This is super valuable if you have a big line of credit or a big stack of cash and you want to go out and buy properties because you can buy something, again, for 100 grand. You can put 50 grand into it, come back and do delayed financing. I cannot get you over and above what you actually paid for it, but I can get you all of what you paid for it. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Oh, so here's a little more details on that. So um, seasoning funds, the cash has to be yours. Can't be mom's, dad's, grandma's, grandpa's because gift funds are not allowed in rental transactions. So we have to be able to verify that those funds were yours or they came from an account that was yours, like a home equity line of credit would be acceptable. Okay, great. So no seasoning requirement and limited original purchase price uh, for the loan. And so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, does this relate to Burr at all? Or is, it, or is that? Yes. Yeah, this is perfect for Burr, right? So um, if you're going to buy a piece of property and you're going to fix it up and then you're going to want to refinance it right away, then we can get you almost all of the cash back out of that, provided that there's enough equity in that property. Okay, so a good example is um, you buy it for 100 and you put in 20 grand worth of work and now it's worth 200, right? That's a, that's a darn good burr. The 200 would be our ARV, right? So that's going to be where we're going to judge our loan size at. So we're, our max loan size in that case is going to be 75% uh, of the 200, so 150. So we can take care of the $100,000 acquisition. We take care of the $20,000 in renovation. We can take care of uh, all the closing costs are involved in the acquisition of that property. So you can't get the 150, but you could get 100 plus 20 plus maybe the five grand in closing costs. But every penny that you put into that, you get back out. Make sense? Okay. So if you have cash, this is a great way to go. If you don't have cash, we use hard money to do kind of the same thing, but with some extra fees. Um, Okay, so LLC, we, I feel like we kind of went into this already, uh, except for there's a couple of extra things on here. Um, even if you uh, lend into an LLC, you're still gonna per personally guarantee it with residential financing. We have a portfolio product that does allow us to lend directly into an LLC, so there's no worry about calling the note due or uh, someone coming back to you or having to refinance it. Uh, generally speaking, they are a little bit more expensive to do it that way. So if you're looking for the protection of what an LLC offers, we have a way to get it into there right away. Um, we also have a, a new lender we just actually brought on, our new investor, that they, o they only do arms. So that's their, a little bit of their kind of their, their shtick that's a little different than normal. But they have a seven-year arm. And the rate on that for lending directly to an LLC for non-owner occupied multifamily, I just priced this yesterday, was under 5%. So still pretty darn good. Yeah, which uh, is, is generally speaking unheard of. Normally you're gonna be paying like five and three quarters, maybe six and a quarter, uh, and probably paying a couple points. So this is a, a new product for us that we're excited about as well. Um, that said, uh, a lot of people are really hung up on the LLC piece. Uh, I say don't let it get in your way. Go buy some properties. Right? I, I see people spend thousands of dollars and months and months of time just getting their LLC just perfect and then they never buy anything. Right? So let's take a step forward and, and buy something and then we'll figure out that, that uh, liability after the fact. Right? Okay. Uh, so there's Fannie Mae's guidelines. You take a picture of that if you like. Um, we already kind of went through it. But again, Freddie Mac does not allow. Uh, so rates of return, we started to dig into that a little bit as well. Um, that was more from a valuation standpoint. Uh, this is what I like to figure on uh, is a couple different levels of rates of return to figure out how am I doing as an investor, right? So cash on cash, that's a relatively simple uh, investment uh, measure and pretty easy to understand, right? So cash on cash, how much money am I netting out of this investment and how much money did I put into this investment? right? So annual gross income minus operating expenses minus mortgage. So this one actually takes into consider a mortgage. So that is truly net, net, net. What am I getting out of this? Divided what I put into the deal, not the price of the deal, but what I actually put in. Return on equity. That's a really important piece to measure. Not so much in the beginning, but it can be, but it's more about as time goes by. Uh, and I'll bring that up. Uh, we got another slide for that later, but that is Similar equation, annual gross income, operating income, or operating expense, annual mortgage expense, but that's now divided by the equity in the property. And why I say this is important is rents don't always rise at the same level as property value, okay? And so if your rents are not rising a lot, but your property values spike way up, what's going to happen to your return on equity? It's going to go down. That's right. So if you bought a deal and the cash on cash return was 10%, you're feeling pretty, pretty good about yourself, right? That's awesome. But as time goes by, if your rents go up a couple of ticks, but your value doubles, well, now you might be getting a four or 5% rate of return, right? And if, so if that happens, it might be time to repurpose that money and go find another investment. Yeah. 
Do you have an average percentage return? So average percentage rate of return like that I would target? Yeah, like over the last three or four years. Yeah, um, well, so I guess everybody's different, right? So uh, the, the question is, what is the average rate of return over the last 30 years? I don't know that I could speak to that. Um, I would say that I have a target of what I'm looking for when I'm looking for an investment. And my target there is over 10%. And that's aggressive. Well, yeah, yes and no, because this is not total return, right? So uh, the question is against the S&P 500. This is just one component of rate of return. And I'll, I'll go into that in one slide here in just a second, and then we'll come back to it, okay? So this piece, though, this comparison with equity versus cash in, if you are only concerned with what your cash on cash return was when you bought it, you're going to miss opportunities down the road that you're going to see your equity return drop and drop and drop. And then it's going to be smart to repurpose those. That's what I'm doing right now. The properties that I bought in uh, 2008, 9, and 10 have really come up in value. The rents are up, but not near as much as the value. So now it's time to recycle those in, through 1031 exchange and move them into bigger properties. Okay, so examples. 350000 20% down. Let's say rents are $2,600 a month. You got mortgage, mortgage expense here, other expenses, management, maintenance, utilities, vacancy. That's, that's everything. Now, keep in mind, vacancy may not be a cash expense, right? This is an estimate, and it's, and it's probably a cash expense somewhere along the line of your ownership, but the percentage you use here can vary depending upon your conservative nature and the marketplace that you're in. But in this case, this property nets $100 per month. That's a cash-on-cash cash return of 1.58%. Not a super great rate of return, right? But we have to consider a couple other things in our equation. Inside of this mortgage at $2,600 a month, the mortgage only payment, or the mortgage payment is $1,800. A good portion of that is principal, right? Not more than half, but a good, good chunk. Let's say it was, uh, I wanna say it was like $650, something like that. That brings your rate of return with principal reduction up over 10%. Now, the thing you have to be cautious of is, Principal reduction is not money you can go spend groceries, right? It's not money you're going to retire on. It's not money that you can pay your mortgage with. But it is your money, right? We're paying down the mortgage. So it, it absolutely is, needs to be considered in the rate of return. Then we bought real estate. Real estate goes up in value over time, right? And to, to the question in the back about 30 years, a good, rate, a good conservative rate of return for appreciation on real estate is about 4% per year if you look at pretty much any 30-year window of time. With a 4% appreciation annually, that brings this same $100 a month net rental income up to almost 20% rate of return, total return. Again, you're not going to spend your appreciation on groceries and gas, but it is something you need to consider as part of your equation. Just like if you're going to talk about the S&P or the stock market, you're going to have the, the value of the stock going up, but also probably some dividends along the way, right? So if you only look at one or the other, you're not getting the total return. So I like to look at total return. Does that make sense? Everybody understand how that works? Would you be excited about a 1.58% rate of return? No. Would you be excited about a 20% rate of return? Right. So now that said, you can talk yourself into doing almost anything, right? So I still probably wouldn't buy this property. But you can see how it has some appeal, right? If this is in an area that's on the light rail trade, you might have some other ideas about why you would buy this, right? So you can have some... some possibilities about why you would make this purchase. Lazy equity is a term that I came up with for just that two slides ago where we talk about your equity going up and your rents not really going up. So this is when the equity in your property is not returning you the rate of return that it should based on what it was when you bought it, okay? So what's one of my absolute most favorite things is to keep an eye on this. I've got a spreadsheet with all my properties in it and all the expenses and all the income. And at the very bottom, I've got an equity calculation and then an equity multiplier. I know that if I'm gonna buy commercial property, I'm gonna need probably put 25% down. So that gives me a four times multiplier. So at the bottom of my sheet, I've got a number that says, hey, if I, the property's worth X and my mortgage is this and my sales costs are this, then I would net out Z. And that Z number, I multiply by four and that's what I could go buy if I sold that property, okay? So if I have a $800,000 fourplex in Linwood, and if I sold it and I got enough cash, I could go buy a $1.6 million building. To me, that's time to make a trade. If I can double my exposure in real estate, 
that's the time to make a trade. Because you don't want to just trade willy-nilly because there's expenses to selling properties. But if you can double it, that to me is the time to make a move. Okay, 1031 exchange. Um, last year, I sold a single family property in Marysville and refinanced a six unit to buy a 37 unit. Uh, the cash flow here was about $700 a month. Cash flow here that I extracted, I took, put, took about 100,000 out. So I cost myself about $500 a month. So I, le I left, I walked away from $1,200 a month in income. But I bought a 37 unit building that makes me about 7,000 a month in income. No extra money out of my pocket. 1031 exchange, you can make those sales and not pay any capital gains. No taxes. Oh, and one other piece too is the depreciable base. You guys understand depreciation? Okay, couple hands. So in mortgage or in real estate, you've got appreciation. Everybody gets that one, right? And you've got depreciation. So the appreciations are really why we buy real estate. Cash flow is a bonus, but appreciation and depreciation are, are awesome. Depreciable base on this house in Marysville was $122,000. I bought it really low. You can't count the land. That's about what it was. That's $4,455 per year that I get to depreciate the building. What the benefit of that to me is that's how much money I can make on that property and not pay any, pay any tax on the income, okay? That is a income tax write-off that's a non-cash expense. It's not a real, it's not a real expense, right? I don't have to write a check for it. Now, you might say, well, your, your building value, your building needs some repairs and some work and the building goes down in value uh, over time. Sure, but I don't have to write a check for it. Making this move, I was able to increase my de depreciable base by buying a $1.5 million building to a million. That's $37,000 a year. That's a huge increase in the amount of money I get to make every year and still pay no taxes. Okay, so another reason why you would do an exchange or, or trade up on a property. Where to go next? Uh, build a team, right? So obviously, we're here to help you. Uh, would love to assist you in, in anything you guys have questions on. Mentors are great. Uh, you mentioned you found a mentor when you were entering into real estate. I've got a couple along the way. Uh, I would say study, read a book or 12, right? So there's a, a lot of great books out there that you can get inspiration from. Networking group, you know, places like this, great ways to get in touch with people. Um, events along the way. Uh, rental housing authority is a great resource as well if you want to ma self-manage or even just get together with some people that have like mind. Uh, here's my book list. Uh, if you'd like to share this, I've read all these in the last couple of years. Uh, I got at least something out of each one of these. Um, probably the, the favorite on there, uh, unrelated to real estate, is um, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And um, the real estate one, for me, uh, there's two. If you're getting started, Set for Life by Scott Trench is a game changer. It talks about house hacking and getting started. Um, and then the other one is Long Distance Investing. I wouldn't be doing what I was doing with the out-of-state stuff if I hadn't read that book. Sweet. That's my presentation. And I know I probably went a little over. Sorry, I get excited. Um, but yeah, I'm going to pass it off to Alex, who's going to talk about wholesale. But anybody have any questions for me before I go? Yeah, so how is this calculated? Yeah. Okay. So the question was, how is depreciable base calculated? I am no CPA. I got to qualify that one quick second. Um, but there's a, a general accounting standard about how that works. You would take your purchase price minus the land value. CPA is usually going to assign that to be somewhere between 30 and 20, 20 and 30% for the land value, and the rest is building, and then to depreciate that over 27 and a half years. And so effectively what the IRS is telling you is in 27 and a half years, your building's worth nothing. You just have the land, that's all that's left. So take care of your building and that won't happen, and it'll probably be worth triple or quadruple what it was when you paid for it. Does that make sense? Sweet. Very true. Yeah, you're not allowed to depreciate your primary. Now, that said, if you house hack and you buy like a duplex, you live in one and live and rent out the other, you can depreciate the other side. Cool? Okay, well, I'll be around if you guys need me. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you so much for watching. Financing is the crucial element of purchasing any investment in real estate. It does not start with the property. It starts actually with financing. Me personally, I probably have close to 30 investors in my list that want to be, want to get a property, want to do something, which is amazing, but they're not approved. I don't have a letter from Cody to share or any other financial institution saying this is what their numbers are. They're ready to go. Time to time, every other week, I do get a deal on my lap and I want to pass it along to someone who is ready to act. 
So please, figure out your financing first, get to know your numbers, get to be comfortable. It takes time to get taxes in place, gets time to get everything ready so you can actually act. Please reach out for more information if needed. Be more than happy to help you out. And please subscribe to this channel for more related uh, real estate related content. Thanks so much.